Okay. Now I'll share my screen. I guess I can't do two things at the same time. <laughs> like me. Okay. So is Macy on the call? I am. And can you see the screen? Um, I can. Okay. Okay. Here I go. Blinded. Okay. You want me to start? Yep. Okay. Blinded. In the closed room where no one wants to be seen, guests have left a trail, though they would redden if aware. It's not the pine scented air, but the closed blinds that marked their presence. Narrow slats, lowered, hang composed on thin cords. Tilted sharp edges overlap, barricading earth's light with their backs. My fingers leave trails across the shade's cold, hard surface. Far away, it seems, Aunt Jo sobs. Her cancer's returned. Clattering conversations suddenly hush. I start to call to her, but decorum overrides. Swallowed into the darkened room, I cease to be. Sneezing, I remove six months debris with a rag, then open and raise the blinds, letting in the low winter sun. A chickadee, my only spectator, peers in from the hanging feeder. My nearest neighbor resides past the clump of bare trees, past the stand of pines, too distant to see. I reopen the door, ready to address deep topics of life and death. But already Uncle Ted, Joe's spouse, is retelling for the 50th time his chicken that didn't cross the road joke. Everyone sighs relief. But behind us, a bird drawn to a pot of forced tulips, blinded to the glass barricade, crashes against the shadeless window. Ooh. Ooh. <clears throat> Hold on, got to blow my nose. Ooh. <laughs> So Macy, thank mm. you. It's hard to be first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so your object was the blinds? Mm -hmm. Obviously. Okay. And which I'm well aware of because I have plantation blinds all over my house, which I didn't have in Appleton. And, this is Macy's um, poem that they just read. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, anyway, so I'm very well no, aware of uh, adjusting them. They're reading the one people sent in. Shut up. Can everybody, can not Carla and not Macy, please mute. I think. Duh. Okay, go ahead, Carla. <laughs> um. I get a little lost in the poem. I mean, I, there you have such wonderful details. And so did Aunt Josie die in this room? No, I, I was just, she just was talking about her cancer and it was a, a serious topic and nobody knew quite how to respond. So all the conversation kind of hushes. Okay, okay, all right. Well, I can see that. Um, I, I love the idea that in this room where no one wants to be seen, and then you know the guests have left a trail um, of you know their being there, I guess. And um, you you know wonderful description of the um, of the blinds and um, the idea of barricading the light, um, and of course your fingers leaves trails across the shades, cold, hard surface. Mine do too, because mine are always dusty. So I don't even sometimes like to touch them because they're so dusty. Um, I especially like the way the poem ends with the bird that you had spotted um, in the stanza, or in the, in, the, in the lines before the bird that you had seen, and then um, running into the barricade of glass um, I have also written about that because it's our fault that we make our windows so enticing and the birds don't see them. So they just keep right on flying and it's, you know, shattering. I've even gone out in, you know, middle of like five degrees and 
held a sparrow in my hand to try to revive it. But um, I'm just a little bit unclear in places what's going on. For example, um, in the third stanza, my nearest neighbor resides past the clump of bare trees, past a stand of pines too distant to see. I don't understand the quotation marks around to see if there's a particular reason for that. Well, just because nobody wants to be seen in this room, but they still close the blinds, even though there's nobody there to see. Okay. Okay. All right. I get that. I get that. Well, my advice to you is to, uh, you know, go back through the poem and you'll find out if other people had, you know, some, uh, you know, issue trying to understand what's going on. Like I said, I've got the crud, so it might just be my head, but I had, I love the view of the blinds and I love the here, but I'm not sure I follow every stanza. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lucy. Are you with us? I thought I saw her. I did too. Who's Lucy? Lucy okay, Terrell. Lucy Terrell. There she is. Here. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I cannot see this well enough at the size that it is. So maybe I have to choose a different view. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's or... see if I can make it bigger. I just have to make the speaker smaller. So I think I'm good. Okay. I witness her fr eager frenzied barking, leaping, ready to run. Musher folding my stitch webbing to place over her head, her paws finding the way to wear me. My red tugs telling her size, brass snap of the tug line, brass snap of the neckline, fits us to the main line with husky lineup. Autumn mud flung by paws. It's too long. What? Please mute yourself if you're... Continue. Yellow aspen leaves spilling down, thickening undercoats of fur, mile after mile of training, snowflakes accumulating, jangle of tags on collars, ears listening for commands, spruce trees lining the trail, booties protecting every foot, countdown to race start, painted lath, Trail markers, tug lines tight, pulling hard, spin drift of snow, swish of runners, musher headlamp glowing the way, caribou pumping over tundra, white out in driving snow, icy overflow to knees, green dancing curtains of light, velcroed on coat swaddles for minus 40, moose crossing trail, danger, frozen meat snacks from Ziploc, Caress for musher's mitts. For Drillian, but I feel it too. Tongue lolling at trail's end. Curled copper coat sleeping on straw. Season circling a dozen times. Too soon, her stumbling legs slow. A warm place inside. Her final passage. I'm, a, I'm hung from a hook. Patina of her fur oils thick on my webbing. Wow. Um, Lucy, I am just loving the details that you have used in this poem. And I'm loving the short lines, that tension that that creates. And um, I don't know if many of you know that, that this and Lucy, maybe I shouldn't even say, but Lucy raises musher dogs and has a great ex you know, experience with sled dogs. So I'm I'm with you in this poem and every step of the way, even feeling, you know, the, the cold at minus 40. And um, you know, your velcro the musher is velcroed into his or her um coat. And um I love it. I mean, the way this po poem moves, um, and the sad way it ends. Um, you know, losing losing a dog. 
And um, so let me ask, Draolin, is that the name of the dog? Yes, Draolin, it's Irish. Okay. And it means wren and her color was wren like brown. I was on a kick of naming my dogs Irish things. <laughs> well, I the only the only suggestion I have and um somewhat of a pet peeve of mine is on the second page of your poem, the second line, yellow aspen leaves spilling down. You don't always need to have a preposition after a verb, even just yellow aspen leaves spilling, thickening under coats of fur. And that's my only suggestion, you know, and sometimes we that's the way we speak. That's our syntax that we almost always, you know, we, we climb up. Well, you really can't do anything but go up if you're climbing. <laughs> and then if you're if you're climbing down, I guess you're descending. But um, that's my only suggestion. This poem really um, spoke to me because of the energy in the lines and the um, the tension that you've created. Um, from what is going on. I feel bad. I mean, I would feel bad for musher dogs and I, I know they like to run. So I would feel really bad about that. But um, wow. What can I say? Thank you. Thank you. Catherine? Catherine Gall? Yep. I saw her. You're next, baby. Yeah. I didn't see her. There she, she is here. Yeah, I know she's here. Well, hang on, I'll come back to hers. How about Kim? I'm here. <laughs> oh, you're here. Okay, back, back to go-go boots. Catherine, only you would write a poem about dancing in go-go boots. Because Catherine is a ballroom dancer, so I'm guessing she's been dancing since 1967 or before. Maybe before. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't find myself because I have everyone on the side of the screen. Me too. So I had to scroll, like, where am I? I think I'm here. Go-go okay. <laughs> boots. White leather at the knee for streetwalkers and stars like Barbara Streisand, Jane Fonda, and me. In my first eye-catching pair atop a tavern table in 1967 with miniskirts slicing the night, smoky air and strobe lights, my thighs wheels of fire, shoulders a siren, legs kicking through hours of abundance and glory, the touch of immortal bass and vocals, blast everlasting. Until next morning when my spine tied in knots wants unwinding, while the boots slump in a hump on the floor. Leather that once rode the backside of a Holstein, lean, long each stride through sunny alfalfa fields, heady the scent of clover, pink heads bobbing until off to the slaughterhouse, ripped, stripped, then dyed white as beach stones before a cobbler stitches them together. Toe box, sole, arch, high heel, to hug a female leg and knee, flesh moving with soft notes of citrus, clover, amber, and patchouli in the belly of velvety go-go love. <laughs> you have no idea how much I wanted that pair of white go-go boots in 1967. It's not I, too late. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I didn't get them, but Aww. some some of my friends had them. But I mean, what a wonderful descriptive poem again, um, with so much energy. And I love your um, your word choices, wheels of fire, shoulders of siren, boots slump in a hump, um, immortal bass and vocals, blast everlasting. I mean, those all those sounds echo so wonderfully in this poem. Um, I, I'm not sure if I 
really like the description of that poor cow who had to give up her hide for your boots, but you know, that's the way it is. And, um, you know, unfortunately, um, but I, I love everything about this poem, um, especially the sounds and the language, the way you turn um, everything on that language is just wonderful. I don't have any suggestions for you. Well, um, thank you. I took it as a challenge because I never write about objects. Oh. And then when you said to try and write from the point of view, so that's why I tried to get the point of view of what it would be like to be the boot. Mm -hmm. That's like that's where it turns in the second half. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I was also thinking back to that poem in my handout, the snakeskin stilettos. I had that written down. Who wrote that? I can't think right now. Who I'll have to look it up. But that's one of my favorite poems. But again, um, the I'm exhausted when I get done reading this poem. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm dancing right along there with you, girl. Thank you. The only oh, sorry. Oh, the, the only suggestion I might have is watch your line endings. I'm kind of a stickler for them. Um, first line, white leather at the knee, line break for streetwalkers and stars. The last line, the last word in a line of poetry is as important as the first one. And a word like for, for example, or um, uh, while the boots slump in a hump on the floor, leather that once rode the I would move the down to the next line because to me that doesn't deserve to be at the end of the line. It's just my only suggestion for you. Thank you. Woo Kim? Okay. Father's turquoise ring. I am every shade of daytime sky in one perfect eye encircled by a silver braid with feathers and scroll work along the band. For five years, I adorn, adorned the third finger of his right hand. An artist, one would think he himself had mixed the color from the pride he took in me. In the end, he would not be domesticated, this firstborn who had always been a small god. She could never be his whole world. One day he set me on the dresser and never returned. I spent 40 years there under her gaze. Wasted devotion or just a blind spot? Okay, so that, that I had a question mark about that B hanging out at the end of the second line of the last stanza and you didn't read it, so that must have been a typo. It was a typo. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, you know, a wonderful description from the point of view of a turquoise ring um, <clears throat> that the idea that this man who is the artist could have created these colors himself, could have created the squirrel work that um, that's on the band. Um, it's sad that one day he set me on the dresser and never returned. Um, you know, the ring there for some reason, just never used again. <clears throat> I, um, I wonder if there's more that could be done with that, but um, I think that what you've got so far, I think works really well. And I like the idea of writing from the point of view of the ring, this object that, you know, is cold, Cold when you pick it up, but it warms to you when you wear it. Do you, do you have the ring? Yes, I do. Wonderful. Do you wear it? Uh, no, because it was my father's ring and it's too large. Oh, yeah. There yeah. are jewels for that. But um, I think it's a wonderful tribute to your father and this ring that he loves so much, but realizing that it could not be his whole world, he had to set it aside and move forward. I like it very much. I have no suggestions for you. I had a question mark next to that B hanging out at the end of the last stanza, third, second line, but you took care of that very quickly. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, 
Estella couldn't be here, so we'll skip hers, come back to it if we have time, but I wanna make sure that we have enough time for the people who are here. And Ronnie had to step away for a minute. Ronnie- I'm back. Okay, good. Okay. I, I have to confess, Carla, that I, I wrote this, um, not for not for you, I wrote this several years ago, but um, I, I wanted to find out what you thought about it. So I put it in. Um, beach umbrella. Does it matter whether they brought me to the beach or rented me from the lifeguard station? Someone dug me into the sand in a swaying motion until I could stand on my own, then opened me to the sun. That summer, it was always strong, insistent, eager to burn. How Marilyn came under my shadowy protection, I don't remember, but she was frighteningly pale, as if her skin had never been touched, exposed to daylight, had no pigment. She refused to extend herself, sitting up, legs discreetly folded toward her side, knees bound close together. She wore dark sunglasses, but of course everyone knew who she was, a precious object to be stored in display cases or on an uppermost shelf. I could see the heat waves rising, children along the dunes watching her like jackals. Mm. I love the surprising ending of this poem, Ronnie. I mean, I, again, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting a benign day at the beach. And um, when you say Marilyn showed up underneath your beach umbrella, I'm immediately directed to Marilyn Monroe. Was that your intention? Yes, and it was in fact Marilyn. I saw her. Wow, she was sitting, oh, wow. She was sitting under the beach umbrella. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> What a what an extraordinary memory. Um, so I I love again the um excuse me, there goes the nose. I love the way that you describe her, where she doesn't extend herself. And I'm guessing personally, you know, she probably wouldn't extend herself either because she was probably very famous. Um, not probably, she was very famous. But I, I love the description, um, and especially the area of the, or the part where you talk about her precious object being a precious object to be stored in display cases. And um, I am surprised at the way the poem ends. Um, I love the way the poem ends with the surprise of the children um, playing along the dunes, watching her like jackals. And um, we all know what happens when kids are at the beach. Sometimes we end up with sand everywhere or, or spilled drinks or whatever. So I like it a lot. I think it works very well as a poem. I think it Thank works you. very well. Yeah, very well as a poem. I like it very much. Um, I don't have any suggestions for you. Your descriptions are meticulous as always. And um, I like that, you know, this poor woman under the beach umbrella was likely going to be, you know, molested by children and jackals. Very nice. Okay. Jan? Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Well, I'm on, because I'm on my phone because my, my computer went out. My, my laptop went out. So I will read. Here we go. Uh, to my blood pressure monitor, when I press start, you tighten the Velcro cuff on my arm, stretched out like an offering. You hum as you go about your task, robot-like, carefree, just doing your job. While I feel the fabric squeeze my biceps, I hold my breath. Your cold, square housed in white plastic, gray and black dial on the ready to reveal numbers, acceptable numbers for my age and sex, or numbers above or below par. Numbers that will trigger my call to 911 or a sigh of relief, thank you, to your dials and to an oval shaped blood pressure pill. <laughs> I have inherited a gizmo just like that from my dad. And um, my I use it for my husband quite often. Um, I, I love this. I mean, 
talk about humanizing a plastic object. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I have only one suggestion for you is the two lines in the second stanza, your cold square housed in white plastic. I would move those up to the top. When I press start, you tightened on the Velcro cuff on my arm, stretched out like an offering. You hum as you go about your task. Um, robot like carefree, just doing your job while I feel the fabric squeeze um, my bicep. I hold my breath and then add, wait for the gray and black dial on the ready, on the ready to reveal the numbers. So I'm just asking you to move the first the first two lines of the second stanza up to the top and then continue by adding perhaps wait for the gray and black dial on the ready to reveal the numbers. Does that make sense to you? I I I I hope so. I uh, so it'll read your cold square housing right plastic. That's the start of the poem. Am, am I right? Yes. And and then when I press start. You tighten the Velcro cuff on my arm, stretch out, blah, blah, blah. You right. hum as you go about your task, robot like doing your job. Um, and where does gray and black dial on the ready to reveal numbers come in? Okay. The last two lines in the first stanza are, while I feel yes. the fabric squeeze my bicep, I hold my breath. And then adding the three words, wait for the gray and black dial on the ready to reveal the numbers. Okay. So create a new stanza there or not. But okay. it, just, it just seems to me when I read this that you described very well the blood pressure monitor. And then um, in sec the second stanza, you also described the blood pressure monitor. And I thought maybe that needed to be up there with the rest of the description. You know, I, I, I you. need... I need to tell you <clears throat> that I don't know everything about poetry. I know some stuff and I know how to write my own poems. And I, all of you, I mean, your poems that I received were dazzling and you're all poets, every single one of you. <clears throat> so I think you need to write your own poem. But if you like that suggestion, go ahead and use it. Um, like I said, I felt like that description needed to be back up on top with the rest of the description of the blood pressure monitor. I hear you. And if I didn't want uh, some suggestions from you, I wouldn't be here tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Angela? Yes, I'm here. The purple shoes. They were the sought after pair in grandmother's basement, the fought over pair with rounded toes, heels for a dancer, the color of grape gumballs, just ripe plums. They oozed the sweetness of a lovely life. They were chosen over the black, red, even the mint green pair from the deep insides of a cardboard box filled with playthings. They deserved to be delicately packed in tissue paper to preserve the luxury, regality, bravery they exuded. The leather had worn with time like the binding of a well-loved book. So once your feet slipped inside, you walked precariously, but always assuredly with your head high. They were so out of character for our saintly grandmother who sat daily in the front pew with her rosary. It's hard to imagine a time she would have worn the shoes with five children in tow, her feet crooked with bunions. How my sister ended up with the purple shoes is still a mystery as each and every one of her seven granddaughters were her favorite. <laughs> I have her kitchen table and would trade it in a heartbeat for the grace and dignity carried inside those shoes. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Again, such a wonderful description. Um, you can see those shoes and they're, they're indeed luscious. And I'm surprised, you know, when I was a kid, I might've picked the red shoes. <laughs> And but I like the purple shoes um, a lot. Um, I might suggest that where <clears throat> about two thirds of the way down the page, the line that begins, they were so out of character for our saintly grandmother. I might suggest a stanza break there. Mm -hmm. um, and 
one other comment that I have is the the um, up up above. They deserve to be delicately packed in tissue paper to preserve the luxury, luxury regality, um, bra and bravery they exuded. In my mouth, regality is kind of a hard word. I might have chosen royalty, for example, or some other. Um, they were regal, but regality just doesn't set with my set with my mouth. It's something for you to think about, not okay. something for you to listen blindly and do. But and then also on the second to the last line, again those um, sticky line breaks. And believe me, I belong to two poetry groups out here and they're always quibbling about my line breaks. It's like, I thought I had it this time. Anyway, in the second to the last line, yeah. I have her kitchen table and would trade it in a heartbeat line break for right. the great dignity um, carried inside those shoes. I don't think the word for deserves its place at the end of the line. Mm -hmm. okay. Argue with me if you want. That but this sense. is the <laughs> I think that um, the poem is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you and for the feedback. Does your sister allow you to see the shoes or? We still argue about it. She has them <laughs> on display in her bedroom on a special place on a shelf. <laughs> Did you have five? How she ended up with them. Wait, seven grandchildren. Yes. Huh. My mother-in-law had a box like that in her closet. She worked at a nursing home and she ran a, um, uh, like a kind of a resale business there, you know, clothes that people didn't want. And when they had enough money, then she would do something special with the residents. So my daughters always ran to grandma's closet when they got there to see what was stuffed inside. And I've got some pictures that are absolutely crazy. Yes. <laughs> special memories. Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Resting Spoon by Rita Kim. Yes, Rita. I, obviously, I didn't hear the um, instruction that said from the point of view of the object, so I apologize for that, but maybe I'll rewrite it from that point of view. Well, the instructions were to write about an object. Changing point of view is completely a choice that you can make. Okay. <laughs> it might be kind of fun to try yeah. that. Yeah. It might be kind of fun to try yeah. that. Resting spoon. You lay patiently in the middle of the stove top, waiting for the cling and the clang of cooking utensils in your welcoming concavity. Your ceramic makeup shines, adorned in purple, pink wildflowers and green leaves, belying your humble origins. When mother came to visit decades ago from faraway lands, she spotted you at the dollar store and said to me, you need one of these. The kitchen was always a busier place back then. Scents of bold indigenous spices with odd sounding names permeating the house. Berbere, Bunj, Ena Adam, Jinjivil, Helk, Enefir, Karfa, Shirosh, Ahit, Esmi, audaciously wafting pungent aromas, impregnating every fabric to the core offending visitors with radically different olfactory preferences until they tasted the stew or drank the coffee or tea and then partook enthusiastically. There you're still, dear spoon, laying in the middle of the stovetop, a constant reminder that she now rests forever, unseen and unheard her love wafting gently and imperceptibly throughout space, impregnating every corner of my soul. I'm so glad you pronounced the names of those spices because I couldn't. I was wondering whether to even not put them there, but then I did because of all the different sounds that they make. Yeah. Um, uh, what culture is this from or what cuisine? This is, is this from, from Eritrea. My mother was Eritrean. Okay, okay. Um, well, I love the poem. And um, I love that the, the there, oh, there's the spoon. <clears throat> I love that the um, spoon is something that is a memento and a reminder of your mother. Um, although you say um, she rests forever unseen and unheard. 
I would beg to differ because I think she's being heard in this poem. Well, thank you and, for that. Yeah. yeah, I'm and and um the only the only suggestion and those grammar fields out there are fully I've been going through this in my head for the last two hours. The first line, you lie patiently in the middle of the stovetop. Yes. And, yes. Then, and then the last stanza, first line, there you are still, dear spoon, lying in the middle of the stovetop. Mm. I mean, it's that that could be a horse apiece, I guess, because, you know, to lie means, you know, to rest or to. Um, I had it in my head an hour ago. I can, but... I can jump in here and, and help you. And so can Lucy yes. Terrell. Maybe we're the sort of grammar grammar police. Um, there's a confusion in, in um, between the verb to lay and the verb to lie. And it's a very common um, error in the American language now. And so it's very difficult to correct it because, um, because the two verbs have sort of joined hands and decided um, that that lay is taking the place of lie. And the problem comes because the verb to lie in the present tense in the past tense becomes lay. Um, so all I can do to tell people um, how to remember the difference is now I lay me down to sleep. It's reflexive. Um, you put something down, it's to lay something down, but you lie down on the bed and a spoon lies in the door, but unless how, it's the past tense. Excuse me, Ronnie, how do you spell uh, the you lie on the bed? L-I-E, the okay. verb to lie, L-I-E, okay. which okay. is a verb that also means um, to tell That's an untruth, mm -hmm. but okay. the verb to lie is to lie down. Mm -hmm. um, and actually to lay, um, um, way back when you could you didn't say that because when you when you lay down um, sometimes or when you were laying it meant that you were having sex um, mm -hmm. but nobody thinks of that anymore it's it's a when you see the verb lie or lay you go ah because it is so it is so problematic now I see many poems written by well-known poets um, on poetry.org um, and you can't correct them because that is that is the language that is the state of the language for some people they don't use the verb to lie correctly because it's you because incorrect is now correct am i making any sense um yes, you are, and thank you for jumping in there with that explanation there's you know <clears throat> several things about the language that have changed that irritate the crap out of me and um but you know, language is fluent, or flu not not fluent in the in, in that sense of the word, but I should language is fluid, and it moves and reflects the culture that we're in. So, um, thank you for that. Yeah. That's a great explanation, Ronnie. Thank you for all your comments. Catherine was going to be late. I. I can't, I can't tell if she's on yet. So we might. I thought I saw her. She chatted, but I think she might have chatted commuting. I don't see her. So we'll come back to her poem when she joined us. Okay. Um, Jackie. She emailed me, so I think she was going to be here. Jackie, I saw Jackie. I saw her mm -hmm. on the chat. Hang on, maybe she can't find herself to unmute herself. Hold on. Oh, there's Catherine. She's here. Okay. Catherine, do you want to read your poem? Uh, I put in the chat um, to be left at the end because I am driving um, oh, okay. to try to okay. beat the storm. <laughs> All so, right, we'll, we'll come back to you. 
So that takes us to Jackie. Hang on, Jackie. She All right. was here, but she's not now. Yep, we'll come back to Jackie too if she rejoins Katrina. All right, Obsidian Thoughts. You touched me with hope. Hold me in the palm of your hand. Wear me worry smooth, soothing the edges of your anxiety. You wonder at creation, the fire that forged me. Dream of something greater that could alter what is. I rest, heavy, cold, and smooth, dense in the weightless air, wishing I too could know the magic of your belief. Hmm. Hmm. Really? The fuck is she talking about? <laughs> this is the object. Yeah, it's a worry stone or a rock or whatever. Pardon me, I've just got to do the nose again. Sure. I think it's unusual, an unusual thing to write from the point of view of, because I mean, I have them, but I don't use them. But who 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 considers what the worry stone is thinking? And um, the idea, well, first of all, I like that this poem is short and concise, and um, the idea of this thing that's a comfort to the owner of it and the worry stone is kind of like I don't know <laughs> just pick me up because I'm cold at the <coughs> in the last stanza I rest heavy cold and smooth obviously if this or if the stone is cold it's not probably currently being held right right yeah and um, the stone wondering, you know, how or, or why this person has attached so much meaning to it. Um, I might suggest in that third stanza, I wait heavy, cold, and smooth. The idea of that stone is waiting to be, you know, picked up again, because when you hold the stone in your hand, it's going to warm in the palm of your hand. So that's my only suggestion for this poem. Um, other than that, I might think about, a, a, you know, obsidian thoughts. Um, I, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't like the title thoughts and uh, maybe obsidian, the obsidian speaks or um, the obsidian remembers something other than thoughts because thoughts is such a an abstract concept and um I, that's the only thing in this poem that i i might consider plus changing that um rather than i rest heavy i wait heavy cold and smooth because if, again if the stone is cold it's not being held does that make sense to you it does i also like how the the waiting kind of plays with the weightiness of the stone too it kind of works in more yes. than one way yes 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 i have a friend in appleton who makes worry birds and she's got these little birds that have a little thumb spot on the tail that you can you know rub it's like a, a worry stone but it's a worry bird and they're really really cute available on etsy but thank oh. you Fun. Thank you. Sharon? Yes. Dear reader, you are starting to depend on me, maybe a bit too much. So that's why I'm messing with you, constantly shifting from couch to table to chair. Sometimes I'm in plain sight, you know, enjoying our games of hide and seek. But I can be serious too when I decide to focus. Happy to do your bidding. Your longing for me quickens daily, seeking sharpness for inscrutable things. Come on, darling, let's decipher the fine print together. <laughs> I love it. Um, I've been doing a lot of, I, I get consumed by 
crime fiction novels. And right now I'm just about the end of a novel and I just want to get back to it. But I've had, I mean, and I read on my Kindle, I read poetry by actually buying the book, but I read fiction on my um, on my iPad because I don't have room for shelves and shelves more of books. I've already, I'm already surrounded by books in my office, but I love it. Um, I like the idea that the, the book is messing with the reader. And I mean, I've yeah, had it's that. Not, it's not about the book. It's about, it's about readers. Um glasses oh the classes oh yeah. oh 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 i am so sorry that's okay oh, oh let's decide for the of course that makes better sense <laughs> yeah. i'm sorry that's I, okay the reader glasses have the reading glasses have a lot of spunk let me tell you <laughs> and i've had the same kind of thing happen with a book so it's not that far off as like, where did I put that book? And I walk all over the house looking for it, the same as um, my reading glasses. Although since I had cataract surgery, I had don't need them anymore, but I love it. Um, when you read the poem, the second stanza, um, the first line, but I can be serious too when I finally decide to focus. You didn't say the word finally. Oh yeah, um, I think I had finally in a different version, and um, so yes, finally should probably be there before the decide. Well, you know, often when we read something, if we skip a word, often that means that word doesn't need to be there. Um, so something to think about. But I now that I know these are reading glasses, uh, um, <clears throat> it makes even more sense. <laughs> Not that it didn't make sense before, but it makes even more sense now. So find those spunky reading glasses of yours and get yourself a book. <laughs> Thank you. It's a wonderful poem. Jenna? Yes. Um, jewelry box, circa 1969. Heavier than expected. Each corner rounded, but no guarantee for child safe contents. The front and top adorned with a row of white daisies and gold stars. The latch clicks into place, waiting for the flimsy tin key to turn it safe. The box lives for decades on the top closet shelf, under clothes too precious to donate, yet riddled with moth marks, and holding within wool fibers the taint of marbles and mildew. The box organizes memories, not in alphabetical order, but by scents and textures. The soil smell of partially rotted primary molars, the smooth mm -hmm. heft of a chestnut braid snipped from her sister's head, a silver dollar air mailed from her uncle's sent in Australia. The queen's profile and sharp crown in relief. She had licked its nicked edges late at night when reading chapter books, outranked sleep. <laughs> I love that. Um, I did not have a jewelry box like that in 1969, but I had I have my um, father's jewelry box that has all of his uh, tie pins and cufflinks back when he wore white shirts to work. So jewelry boxes can be so much fun to look into and especially for the cool things you find there. Um, I, first of all, poets have so few words to, to, to work with, and I'm looking at in the first stanza, the use of the word safe twice in the stanza. And um, when it, um, it made sense when you read it, that it wasn't child safe, but by locking it, it became safe. So um, ignore that comment, um, unless you can think of a better word. Um, moth marks, I might've said moth holes, um, because moths definitely chew holes and things. 
and the idea of the taint of Marlboros and mildew, I mean, that just sets my senses on fire. So I can definitely see that. Um, the only other comment I have, Jenna, is um, I don't know what Australia's currency is, but would they have a silver dollar? Um, I have it, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. That, I mean, I have a silver dollar too, but not with a queen on it. That's pretty cool. So they must have a similar currency to the U.S. Well, um, it's Australian, so it's so they go by the queen because it's really an English colony. But mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they called it a silver dollar, but it's it's the same heft as like an American silver dollar would have been. Right, right. Yes, exactly. I have a silver dollar too. So, <laughs> excuse me. Um, that silver dollar that this little girl licked late at night when reading, it just sends a squirm right through me. And um, I am sure that's probably, you know, a good thing. Um, it, it was one of those like, moments even even more so than um the mildew and the and the moth holes and the marbles but i like the poem very much um i'm guessing that the little girl probably used this as something you know for comfort yeah i have the box if anyone cares to look at it voila <laughs> oh how cool <laughs> so you unlock it and this like clicks open and then you can open it and yep. then you can keep whatever you want in there. So um yeah. I'm not yeah. sure why I still have it, but it must mean something to me that I do. <laughs> yes, and, and that's important. I have written about a, a tin box that my parents had that my dad had that I was never allowed to look at. And you know now after he died it became mine, so it was one of those things that's like wow look at all this stuff in here, including the teeth that my dad had pulled. It's like why would anyone keep teeth? But I got rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I like it very much, Jenna. Annette. Okay. Um, well, I wrote about this collection of skate keys that I have. <laughs> and um, I shared this with a group of fourth graders last week and nobody uh, knew what it was, even the teacher didn't. So a little history lesson here. Don't lose the skate key. A slightly rusty metal skate key tightens toe clamps of my roller skates. The square hollow tube on one end slides over a prong under the wheels, snugs each clamp to my shoes. The only good thing about my ugly brown Oxfords is the tight grip over leather soles. Buckling thin leather skate straps around my ankles, I push off from the front porch steps, swing my arms side to side across my chest, gain momentum, breeze in my hair, steel wheels glide the concrete. I orbit the neighborhood like Sputnik, zoom up Kent Street, left on Zimmerman, skate over to Ross Avenue on my way to Dairy Queen on Grand. There's a dime in my pocket for a chocolate cone plus a penny for tax. Singing one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people leader, dodging cracks in the sidewalk, a skate key swinging from my neck on a piece of twine. Uh, that this poem resonates with me so much. Um, I have, you know, scars on my knees from, you know, flying on the roller skates. We had, my neighborhood had um, sidewalk squares like broken teeth. So it was really easy to you know, go flying and end up on those knees. And then, you know, that's the kind of um, injury that really hurts for days. But I don't think I have a skate key, Annette. I have a drum key, which- Oh, I'm I have four of them. Do you want one? <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, I love it. I love the description um, of, of you going off on your skates free as a bird. 
in a time when young people could be free as a bird um, and not have to worry about some creep you know, you know, waiting to attack you, which is the world that we seem to live in now. Um, my only suggestion is the line, I orbit the neighborhood like Sputnik. Um, I would maybe try to push some more Sputnik stuff in there, you know, zoom, you know, zoom up Kent Street, left on Zimmerman, you know, whatever you, you, I, if it were me i would be agonizing over this and looking up you know Spun, sputnik terms to include but um <clears throat> i like the poem very much it brings up i think all good poems resonate with with readers and this just really resonates me back to when i was that age and um i must have lost all my skate keys and <clears throat> don't ask me why i had a drum key but i still have it Oh, a what key? Drum? A, a drum key. The a drum <clears throat> the snare drum has a head oh, on it. Okay. And then you would you know tighten the whatever those things were with a drum key. I used to um <clears throat> I played drums from when I was in sixth grade all the way through my sophomore year in college. But um then I decided to get married and the heck with the drums. But anyway, Annette, this poem really resonates with me a lot. Oh, well, thank you. Do you think adding more Sputnik terms would, does it make it, uh, is it okay to make it longer then, you're saying? Um, so reveal a little bit more of what Sputnik was, is that? Well, I mean, I'm not really sure. You know, now that I think about it, I, you know, that was Sputnik would be from a certain gener generation and we're all enamored with that and and Telstar and oh, which Telstar, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I could almost still sing the song. Yeah, there was a song. Okay, that's I I can add a, a few more things. Yeah, I was trying to set, I guess, the time, the time period. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't know. I think I quit roller skating on sidewalks when I was probably in sixth grade, but then I, you know filter it on over to the neighborhood roller rink where I spent <clears throat> Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday afternoon, but not on those kind of skates. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. June, and then Kathy. Nothing returns. Yeah, yeah I'm here. Sorry. And then after this one, we'll go to uh, Kat, go back to Catherine. Okay. 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 Nothing returns. Not my parents from the 1934 photo, their wedding day. Not the bull of a watch my mother gifted my father. Each chrome plated link and its gold inlay trim shines, radiates romance, fired by the joy of music and laughter. Reflected light surrounds the watch, inscribed RH to Jay-Z, its home, my dresser, a memento in its faded, yet plush green case. No longer the milestone anniversaries or emblazoned, emblazoned insignia of celebration, no longer a need to measure time. From these ancient shadows grow the truth of tarnished treasure, vanished except for the memories. <clears throat> June, there's a real sadness and sense of loss in this poem. Um, this sense of that passage of time, which none of us can seem to escape. Um, I only have a couple of suggestions for you. And <clears throat> excuse me, um, I might delete the entire last stanza and then move except for the memories and move it up to the fourth stanza so that it would read no longer the milestone anniversaries or emblazoned and sing mm. of celebration no longer a need to measure time except for the memories hmm. okay um and the reason i suggest that is i don't think that the last stanza adds more it's just reflection off of the last reflection uh-huh. And, and um again, your poem, so you'll have to decide what to do. 
And then I'm going to quibble with line breaks again for you <laughs> because mm -hmm. I can. Second stanza, each chrome plated link line break and its gold inlay trim shines, radiates line break, romance fired by the joy of music and laughter. And that's kind of the way you read it. Okay. Could you do that stanza one more time, Carla? Yes, I will. Each chrome plated link stands a break and its gold break. inlay trim shines, radiates, stands a break, romance fired Thanks. by the joy of music and laughter. Okay, thank you. You mean well, line break. I'm just correcting you, Carly. You said stands yes, a break. I'm sorry, <laughs> line yes, break. Line break, thank you, Ronnie. Uh, we're going back to Catherine. Yep. Did we ever find Becky? I didn't see her join. Oh, you didn't. Well, what did I do with? What number is Catherine? T 10. Oh, oh, to the bolo tie right in front of me. Catherine, want to read your poem? Yes, um, I, I think I have a different version. It's revised and I apologize for that. Um, but I couldn't find the one I sent. <laughs> Ode to a bolo tie. There are hundreds of options on Amazon. I'd rather find you in a thrift shop among floral brooches, gospel bracelets, brass bangles. I see you inside a glass display, turquoise center, silver etched swirls. The frayed leather rope holds you together, cracked with mud between creases and crusted in black braiding. The soil from a land in Nevada where horses, cattle, corn, and hay soak in sunbeams. Then you will grace my neck and chest, dreams of banjo twang and cowbell clang between moos and nays outside a tobacco barn under a strawberry moon that reflects off the lake, which ripples from glugel jumps and strider swipes. This world held within your stone that escapes into my bones to create a new memory of Western love stories, though I know nothing of the truth within your nuts. I, it seems like the version you sent is the one you read. Um, I don't know if anybody. Oh, else, yeah, I think it is. So I like the idea. And, you know, I wonder if in, you know, 50 years when you become famous and enter the great literary canon, Catherine, if anyone is going to know what Amazon is, but whatever. <laughs> but I love <laughs> Mm, I'm so sorry. I love <coughs> I love the line floral brooches, gospel bracelets, and brass bangles. I just love the sound of that line and all the jingling that it brings up in my head. Um I also like the idea that you're inhabiting something that belonged to someone else. And that by wearing it, you have inhabited even more. I mean, if you're wearing it on your skin, then that mud or sweat or DNA from that person has now entered yours. And I love that idea. The only suggestion I have for you is um, near the end, this world held with your, within your stone that escapes into my bones to create a new memory. I'm I'm not sure if escapes is the right word. Maybe melds or permeates or joins rather than escapes. Because it I mean it doesn't you become one with it. So it's not like it's escaping and jumping onto you and going, ha ha, I've now inhabited Catherine, but it somehow becomes part of you. Does that make sense to you? I do like melds a lot. Yeah. 
yeah, it just becomes, it's a thing that, um, that was worn and held and probably stroked by somebody else. It's now become yours and you are now becoming part of that bolo necklace. It's a wonderful description in your poem. I like it a lot. Thank you so much. That's, that's really wonderful. Thank you so much. And my husband did get me a box of bolo ties for Valentine's Day. They're <laughs> off of Amazon actually. So I don't know if you got the memo, but at least, you know, it was a sweet gesture. <laughs> Was it were they used? Because sometimes you can buy antique things like that on Amazon. Sadly, they were new, but he said I meant to find it in a thrift shop, but I ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thank you so much. <clears throat> it's the thought that counts. For sure. Marilyn. I know I saw her, so we'll give her a chance to unmute herself. Okay. There, Marilyn. Can, you, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. This is kind of confusing. Um, okay. Time. Do you, I have a picture of the clock. I, I have a picture of the object. Do you want to see it? How about after you read it? Okay. Time. The rectangular gold clock does not tick anymore. Its hands remain one up, one down. 1230. Is it night or day? Must be midday. For the painting pictured on the clock is of a pink, poofy dressed woman on a swing. She ruffles the wind created as she soars forward. Her summer hat catches the breeze. Two white wigged male companions and two and three sorry and three marble cherubs watch her enthralled bare legs peek out amazed amazed to be so free a high-heeled shoe wings its way skyward time stand still. So I'm not surprised that an artist <laughs> love would create a necrostic poem. Have you um, read Ronnie Hess's new book? Oh, uh, there, Ronnie. Sorry, I couldn't hear. I said, have you read or seen Ronnie Hess's new book, Tripping the Light Acrostic? Is that the title? Yeah, no, no, and I'm, I I would look forward to seeing that. Since she, 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 since she has written uh, a blurb for my new books coming out um, about um, travel um, in the southern in the southern hemisphere. Anyway, be careful, Marilyn. <laughs> I'm listening. What? what? I'm listening. Oh, I'm listening. No, I know. No, I, Ronnie, it was a great, it, it was a great, thank you. Anyway, the only thing um, I have to say other than I wanna see that picture, cause I was gonna take time to go and look it up, um, but I might play with some line breaks. Okay. The rectangular gold clock line break, oh, not take anymore. I line was break. with Dorothy, I didn't go skating. I didn't go skating. Wait, what? What? Keep going. Keep going. <clears> His <throat> hands remain one up, one down, 1230. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm going to get get to this one. Two white wigged male companions line break and three marble cherubs watch her enthralled. Again, Anne does not earn its place at the end of a line, but Sharon Olds would disagree with you. 
but um, I'm telling you to make a line break there. I think that your your poem is really captures, I mean, I almost don't want to see the image because I have a picture in my head of what this clock looks like. Yes. And I also, I kind of want to leave it that way, but then I do want to see the image um, to see where you came from when you were writing this. Do you, do you own this clock? Yes, I do. Wow. I do. So I love the I idea. Can, I, I mean, I can show you. Uh, yes. mm, I, I don't know how to do that, but I could hold it do. Hold up in front of the camera. Yeah, uh, just, hold, just hold it up. Uh, can't really see it very well. But we trust you and we believe you. Um, I love the idea, again, of the high-heeled shoes, wings its way skyward. Um, you know, this woman or young girl who's on the swing is fully embracing the moment of flying and um, her one of her shoes is gone as proof of it. So awesome job. Thank you. R.B. Simon. I don't know if I saw her. Did anybody see her? Uh, no. No, I don't see her. So we'll move on. Heidi? Yes, hi. I'm trying to break it up, but I don't think so. All right, I'll... Uh, Start with my poem is called Silver Spoon. Oh, fuck. My shining silver teaspoon, old Maryland engraved, a long sleek gray handle. Looks like rose mauling, my son said. Set in place at dressed up family table, smooth, cool, balanced oh. in hand. Its bowl shimmers a reflection. Venetian cranberry glass in calm candlelight. After dinner walk with my tall boys, Sterling Lake ice sunset glazed in gold rosé. Very nice. Yeah. Again, um, your description is so well done that I can see this spoon. Um, and it's interesting that your son said it looks like rose mauling. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have some rose mall pieces here that I did not paint. My father-in-law always wanted me to take it up, but it required using oil paints. And um, I just was not interested in doing it. And my father-in-law also made some museum pieces that are at the Norwegian American Museum in, um, in Decorah, Iowa. He has um, some plates there, and I think a, it's called a Tina, T-Y-N-E. It's mm. a box. I have one. It is a box. Mine is shaped like a dragon head, and you pull the tail and the head, and the pop top pops off. Yes. Yeah. Lovely. I'm, I'm going to guess that a lot of people don't know what rose modeling is. The fact that your son does, I think, is pretty darn cool. Well, it was cool, and he was actually pretty young when he said that and I had some rose mauling pieces on the wall um, but I had never associated the spoon pattern with rose mauling and when he said that I was like well no wonder I like it so much <laughs> it's just like <laughs> rose mauling <laughs> so that right. was a, a neat memory for me in and of itself let me close my door my dog is barking I don't know what he's barking at, but it could be the neighbor. Well, that'll teach him to get the door closed. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he's usually in my office or he's right outside the door. So I might suggest um, the first three lines and putting a period along a sleek gray handle. Mm -hmm. And then in quotation marks, it looks like Rose Molling, my son said. 
Um, you want me to say it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then set in place at a dressed up family table. We, at one time, people were writing poetry and they're leaving out some of those articles. But I think that um, set in place at a dressed up family table sounds a little bit more modern, maybe. And I'm wondering, um, you need to think about this, but I'm wondering if you need that last stanza at all. Okay. Yeah, I, my thinking is, you know, silver spoon, born with a silver spoon in their mouth, talks about wealth. But my thinking is family and how it reminds you of family is the real wealth. Um, so I was just including a time with family after the dinner. I think, I think it's a fine, it's a fine thing. And again, this is completely up to you, but I love the um, re the bowl shimmers, a reflection, Venetian cranberry glass in calm candlelight. It's such mm -hmm. a strong, beautiful image to end on. Okay. But again, think about it. It's your poem. Um, mm -hmm. And I and then the line, Sterling Lake Ice Sunset Glazed. Um, I, I almost want to have some punctuation in there. Because when I read that, I thought, hmm, maybe mm -hmm. it made me stop. And then after I looking at it, um, I, I read everybody's poems two or three times. And I thought, well, do you even need to have that stanza? So again, think okay. about it. It's your poem and yours to do. I know what pleases you, but I, I'm wondering if you even need to, to have it because you have such a wonderful last image in um, the very first stanza. Mm hmm Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Kurt? Hmm. I thought I saw him, but maybe I didn't. Okay, no Kurt. Well, Carla? Yes, ma'am. Since you're not feeling well, maybe we can end a little early. That would please me. Yeah. <laughs> Before I start so, having a yep. job. Yes, yeah, so you, yes, you soldiered on so valiantly and I think we covered everybody who's here. So thank you very much for your feedback. Um, I will let everybody know when I have another workshop scheduled. I'm working on a couple right now. And then thank you very much, Carla, for all your insightful comments. Um, I just like to, I'd like to, to say, uh, just sure thing. I was going to say this when we began, um, was I was very pleased and maybe surprised, although I don't know why I should be surprised because you're, we're dealing with mostly Wisconsin poets, except for Kate Baroletti, who's from way down under. Um, I just was so pleased with the quality of the poems that you turned in. I was just like, these are really good. <laughs> I'm going to have to really think hard to come up with some suggestions, but I was so pleased and it was such a pleasure to read them. And I thank you so much for entrusting me with your poems. Again, it's they're your work and you make the final decision on it. And um, keep on writing people. I love it. Thank you very much, Carla. Thank you, Carla. Yeah, thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank, Be well. Thank you, Carla. Bye-bye. Well. Yes, get better. Hope get you better. feel better. <clears throat>